Today we're going to tackle the last in our series on the four Gospels, and we're about to move into some really profound territory. So go get a Bible and buckle up, because it's time to get started. We've been looking at the ancient records of the life and teachings of Jesus, which are, of course, the four gospel accounts that you find at the beginning of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And, and today we're going to wrap up that brief study by looking at the fourth gospel, the gospel according to John. And it's a record that is substantially different from the other three. In fact, scholars refer to Matthew, Mark, and Luke as the synoptic gospels, a word that literally means to see together. Because while each of those books obviously has its own emphasis, its own flavor, they basically follow the same outline and cover a lot of the same ground. But then when you get to John, things are suddenly different. It's got a completely different feel, a completely different structure. Where the other three Gospels begin with some kind of life event, like a birth or a baptism, John begins his account by stretching all the way back to the origin of the universe itself, using language clearly designed to remind you of the book of Genesis. Now, I'm sure you're probably familiar with it, but let me read just a few verses to show you what I mean. This is talking about Jesus, and it uses the expression, the Word, to describe Him. It says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. As we looked at the other Gospels, we saw that the ancient Christians compared each of them to the four faces of the cherubim, the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle, because of the way uh, the style and the central themes of each of the books fit so neatly with those symbols. Matthew emphasized Jesus as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, or the Son of David. Mark was underlining Jesus as a patient servant, like an ox. Luke, who was writing for Gentiles, takes us through a study of Jesus as the Son of Man. And each of those three Gospels tended to stress horizontal relationships showing us how Jesus related to us, his fellow human beings. But now when we get to John, we see a distinctly vertical relationship that opens up a line between heaven and earth. Now we're looking at Jesus, the Son of God. And what John does right out of the gate is underline the deity of Christ. This is not just a great teacher, or a kind man, or a wise philosopher. This is the Creator himself in human flesh. And it seems that back in the first century, during the time when the Christian church was brand new and spreading like wildfire, there were already people challenging the notion that Jesus was God in human flesh. And that challenge still persists to this day. I sometimes still hear critics suggesting that the deity of Christ was some kind of fourth century invention that made its way into the church after Constantine and the Council of Nicaea. But it's simply not true. The critics of Jesus' deity stretch back a couple of centuries before Nicaea. And if the idea was invented later in the 4th century, you've got to wonder what those early critics were arguing against if the church wasn't already teaching Christ's divinity. The biggest problem emerged in a group we now know as the Gnostics. These were people largely influenced by the major centers of learning in North Africa people who managed to synthesize the teachings of pagan mystery schools with the teachings of the Bible. In reality, that was happening long before the birth of the Christian church because some Jewish scholars living in Alexandria tried to demonstrate that their beliefs were somehow compatible with the teachings of Greek philosophers. And this created a bit of a problem because the Hebrew scriptures emphasized a good and material creation made by a supreme God. The Greeks, as we've studied in the past, couldn't accept that because they believed that the material physical world is some kind of mistake. It couldn't possibly be the work of a supreme God, and some lesser deity must have made it. 
Now, Gnostic Christians followed in their footsteps and subscribed to that kind of Greek cosmology. And that led to all sorts of confusing questions about who Jesus was supposed to be. As far as the Gnostics were concerned, he couldn't possibly be God, not if he was a real human being. Because a physical existence would be so far beneath God, he would never do it. So instead, some of them insisted that Jesus was simply a man who had special privileges or abilities, but he was still just a man. Or the other story that some of them came up with was to say that Jesus only appeared to be human, that it was just an illusion designed to help us relate to him. Now, if you read the writings of an early church father named Irenaeus, a man who was born not too long after John the Apostle died, you discover that much of the early church believed that John wrote his gospel to counteract early proto-Gnostic heretics because their ideas were starting to worm their way into the church by the end of the first century. In particular, there was a troublesome teacher named Serinthus who insisted, like the Gnostics did later, that a supreme God could have never made the physical world. So Jesus, he said, was just a human being, the literal biological son of Joseph and Mary. What made Jesus special, Serinthus taught, was the fact that the Holy Spirit descended on him at his baptism, but then he said the Spirit left again the moment Jesus was crucified. So I guess you could say that Serinthus was teaching that during his ministry, and only during his ministry, Jesus was some kind of a supercharged human being, but still just a human being. So here's what we have from Irenaeus. Is he explains why the Gospel of John was written. This comes from an early apologetic work known as Against Heresies, and this is what he writes. He says, John, the disciple of the Lord, preaches this faith. So he's talking about the orthodox Christian faith here. And seeks by the proclamation of the gospel to remove that error which by Serinthus had been disseminated among men, and a long time previously by those termed Nicolaitans. You'll find those people mentioned over in the book of Revelation who are an offset of that knowledge, falsely so-called. So let me push the pause button for just a moment and explain that. The word Gnostic is derived from the Greek word gnosis, the word for knowledge. And the Gnostics believed that they were members of an intellectual elite that had special knowledge about the nature of the universe. Let's continue. Who are an offset of that knowledge, falsely so-called, that he might confound them and persuade them that there is but one God, who made all things by his word, and not as they allege that the Creator was one, but the Father of the Lord another, and that the Son of the Creator was, forsooth, one, but the Christ from above another. You see, the Gnostics believed that the Supreme God is so far removed from our imperfect material universe that there must have been lesser deities, emanations from the Supreme God, who did a bad, bad job of creating this world. But what John does with his gospel is confront that idea right out of the gate. Jesus the man is not only the Son of God, but is the Creator. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. All right, we do have to take a really quick break right now, and you'll probably want to take advantage of the resources that the Voice of Prophecy is about to offer you. But then we'll come right back and unpack this somewhat mind-blowing gospel. Dragons, beasts, cryptic statues. Bible prophecy can be incredibly vivid and confusing. If you've ever read Daniel or Revelation and come away scratching your head, you're not alone. Our free Focus on Prophecy guides are designed to help you unlock the mysteries of the Bible and deepen your understanding of God's plan for you and our world. Study online or request them by mail and start bringing prophecy into focus today. I think the incarnation of Christ might be one of the hardest concepts that human beings have to grapple with when they first approach the teachings of Christianity. How in the world can somebody be fully God and fully man at the very same time? How can the Creator of heaven and earth possibly condescend to become one of us? It's a subject that frankly stretches the very limits of our thinking, and because it seems so foreign, a lot of people give up and they adopt some kind of alternate theory. Perhaps Jesus was 
just another ascended master or some kind of special teacher or prophet who belongs in a lineup with the other great religious leaders. The list of alternatives we've come up with is nearly endless, and you might be able to sustain some of those theories in the first three Gospels, if you read them selectively. But the Gospel of John doesn't really give you any wiggle room. It begins with a full-on assault against the people who believe that Jesus was only human. And maybe one of the trickier things we find in John's opening salvo is this concept of Jesus as the Word. It's an English translation of the Greek word logos, which you still find appended to a lot of academic English words like biology or geology. That ology at the end of those words is the Greek word logos. It's also the root for the English word logic, which is the study of rational principles. And to the Greeks, the logos was the underlying logic of the universe, the universal principle that causes everything and holds everything together. So, for example, there was a notable Greek thinker named Heraclitus who lived about 500 years before Christ, and he taught that the universe was made of fire. Why? Well, because the universe is always changing, just like the flames of a campfire. But underneath that constant change, we find never-changing principles and a universal law that holds the universe together. That universal law, Heraclitus said, is the Logos, a divine wisdom that directs the course of nature. The Stoics, who came along a couple hundred years after that, taught something similar. The universe is made of fire, and someday it's going to end in a huge apocalyptic disaster. Everything's just going to burn up. But in the meantime, the divine Logos, the principle behind the fire, organizes the physical world around us, taking on the forms of the things you see. All of us, the Stoics taught, are just sparks that leap from the divine fire, and eventually one day we will leave our physical bodies and go back to the fire. It was kind of a version of pantheism, which teaches that God is in everything and everything is God. But what these Greek thinkers never, ever did was to say that the Logos became a man that this divine power behind the universe became a specific human being at a specific moment in human history. So that is exactly where John parts company with the Greek philosophers. Jesus is the Logos, the divine wisdom that created the universe and provides the gift of life. And He was born as a real human being. It's a thought that demands so much from our intellect that it's hard to believe that somebody was just making that up in order to write a good story. Greek mythology had half-human deities like Hercules, but they would never put the infinite God in a human body. Other religions had great prophets who were guided by God or by the gods, but they didn't dare suggest that these prophets were God Himself. Pagan kings from Egypt to Babylon were said to be members of the pantheon with divine attributes, but they were never the supreme creator of the universe. So with Jesus, a man who never occupied a worldly throne, we suddenly have this surprising claim that He is fully God and fully man at the very same time. This humble son of a carpenter is God in human flesh. This is precisely where the people who love to say that Jesus is nothing but a fictitious rehash of ancient mythology run into trouble. I've heard people say that Jesus is nothing but a retelling of the sun god Apollo. and I've seen other people suggest that the story of Jesus as we find it in the Bible is nothing but a rehash of the story of the Egyptian god Horus. And I suppose at first blush, it almost looks like these people have a point. After the rise of Constantine, when the Roman state started to blend with the church, all kinds of pagan myths and ideas started to make their way into the Christian church. So yes, it's easy to find ancient pagan icons on display in churches in Europe, because there was a deliberate merging of the church with the pagan Roman Empire, and there was a degree of cross-pollination. For example, you'll often see halos over the heads of important Christian characters in order to emphasize their sanctity. And that was an idea that was borrowed from the pagans, who occasionally put sunbursts over the heads of some of their gods. If you go to a more 
traditional church, one that uses old liturgies and orders of service, you will find elements in the worship service that date all the way back to the earliest centuries of the faith. Some of those were borrowed from Jewish synagogues, but others were borrowed from ancient Greek mystery schools who loved good purification rituals. But for the most part, most of the pagan artifacts we find in Christian imagery are harmless. They don't really matter. Now, personally, I do think there are a few things we might want to run past the Bible to see if we're doing things literally by the book, but that would be another topic for another day. There's just little doubt that particularly after the fourth century, there was a bit of tradition blending that did take place. And that makes rich fodder for people who want to say that Jesus was nothing but an extension of pagan mythology. Yet, when you read the opening verses of John's Gospel, it becomes immediately obvious that this can't possibly be true. The Jesus in these opening verses is not presented as being somehow parallel with Greek mythology. Instead, John places him in stark contrast to the gods of Mount Olympus. This man that John describes is a physical incarnation of the creator of the universe. And from that point forward, John sets out to prove this by tracking the life of Jesus in a way that produces this big sense of urgency. There's this never-ending clock that ticks away in the background of the story in John. At least seven times, John directly mentions the approaching hour of Jesus' death. We get a glimpse of what God looks like by following Jesus, but it happens under the pressing shadow of something horrible. Our selfish natures and our hatred for God are shortly going to put Jesus to death in the most shameful way imaginable. This story is God expressing His profound love for us, but at the same time, it reveals our profound wickedness because we want it to murder the Creator. You know, I often hear people talk about the Bible as if it's a simple fairy tale that doesn't have much to offer 21st century thinkers. But I know for sure that people who suggest such things have never honestly wrestled with the Gospel of John because I'll tell you, there's nothing simple about it. It explores the deepest and most important questions ever asked, from human origins and consciousness and the meaning of life and the problem of evil. It's not the kind of book you can read in a single setting and hope to understand completely. In fact, the concepts are so lofty that the ancient description of John's Gospel as an eagle makes really good sense. His is a book that will carry you far above the surface of the earth and give you a glimpse of this world as you've never seen it before. And at the same time, it gives you a peek behind the curtain of the universe so you can catch a glimpse of God Himself. In fact, there's a dramatic scene you find in John's Gospel over in chapter 8 that underlines this. And it's a scene that isn't found in the other three Gospels. Jesus is discussing His mission with the religious authorities who were having trouble accepting that He had any kind of spiritual validity. And at one point, He tells them, much to their chagrin, that they cannot claim to be descendants of Abraham unless they relate to God the way that Abraham did, and that's through faith. And then Jesus tells them that instead of having God for a father, they have the devil for a father. Let me read just a bit of this. This is John 8, verse 42. It says, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Pretty heavy stuff. And now it's time to take another break. So don't you go away. I'll be right back with the rest of the story. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we're committed to creating top quality programming for the whole family, like our audio adventure series, Discovery Mountain. Discovery Mountain is a Bible-based program for kids of all ages and backgrounds. Your family will enjoy the faith-building stories from this small mountain summer camp and town. 
With 24 seasonal episodes every year and fresh content every week, there's always a new adventure just on the horizon. Okay, just before the break, we were in John chapter 8 where Jesus tells the religious authorities that the devil is the real father. And of course, his critics return the favor by suggesting that Jesus is an unclean Samaritan possessed by a demon. Let's pick it up now in verse 49. Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. And I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Now, don't forget, the Gospel of John opens with Jesus as Creator and the source of all life. So this is really a declaration of His deity. He's telling these people that He possesses the very gift of life. Now, listen to their response. Then the Jews said to Him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And you say, If anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead? And the prophets are dead. Who do you make yourself out to be? And that right there is the whole point of John's Gospel. Who do you think you are? Who is this great moral teacher who heals the sick and raises the dead? Who is this man who claims that he has seen God the Father? That he is one with God the Father? And he can show us the character of God perfectly. Let's continue in verse 54. It says, Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that He is your Father. Yet you have not known Him, but I know Him. And if I say I do not know Him, I shall be a liar like you, but I do know Him and keep His word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Now don't miss what Jesus just said. The nation of Israel claimed Abraham as their father, as the one who established a covenant with God. And now Jesus suddenly says that Abraham knew him. And that's absolutely true. In fact, in the 18th chapter of Genesis, we see God himself paying Abraham a personal visit. And when you sort through all the evidence in both the Old and New Testaments, it becomes pretty much obvious that it was Christ himself who paid Abraham that visit. And of course, these religious leaders knew that God had spoken to Abraham. And so this was really another claim to divinity. Let's wrap it up now, starting in verse 57. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. So why did they suddenly try to stone Jesus? It's because they thought he was guilty of blasphemy. Blasphemy was the act of claiming to be God or having attributes that belong to God alone, which is why Jesus also ran into trouble when he claimed to have the power to forgive sin. That was only the prerogative of God. And just in case somebody might have missed what Jesus was saying, he said, before Abraham was, I am. Now that's the literal meaning of the Tetragrammaton. Y-H-W-H, the four-letter name of God. And it's the name that God gave Moses when Moses asked who was speaking to him from the burning bush. The I Am. The I Am is the self-existent God, the one who goes back to the far, far reaches of eternity, the one who has no beginning or end. Jesus just declared that he was not only friends with Abraham, but he was the God who led the children of Israel out of Egypt. Part of me thinks that this might be the reason that John doesn't provide us with a genealogy. Matthew was demonstrating Jesus' legal right to the throne of David. Luke was demonstrating his ancestry all the way back to Adam. But John is focused on showing us God who doesn't have a beginning. Seven times Jesus says, I am in the Gospel of John, which is not a coincidence because seven is the biblical number of completeness and perfection. It's the number the Bible uses to point us to God. And on one occasion in chapter 18, when Jesus utters the words, I am, the crowd that came to arrest him suddenly fell to the ground. Now here's the story the way John tells it. Jesus, therefore, 
knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Now, the word he is supplied. It's not actually there in the original Greek. The original just says, I am. It continues. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now, when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Okay, time for one last break before we wrap things up. So sit tight because I'm coming back right after this. Life can throw a lot at us. Sometimes we don't have all the answers, but that's where the Bible comes in. It's our guide to a more fulfilling life. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we've created the Discover Bible Guides to be your guide to the Bible. They're designed to be simple, easy to use, and provide answers to many of life's toughest questions. And they're absolutely free. So jump online now or give us a call and start your journey of discovery. To be honest, we could probably spend an entire year in the Gospel of John exploring the various ways that this favored disciple underlines the deity of Christ. Jesus tells Nathanael that he saw him sitting under a fig tree without actually being there. And then shortly after that, he identifies himself as the ladder in Jacob's dream. Then in chapter 2, Jesus turns water into wine. And then he cleanses the temple, which he calls my father's house. He tells Nicodemus that he has the power to recreate him, which is where Christians get that expression, born again. And then Jesus heals a lame man by just speaking to him the same way the Creator spoke the universe into existence. John shows us a Jesus who can forgive sins. He claims to be one with the Father, and he raises his good friend Lazarus from the dead. Most assuredly, Jesus said, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in Himself, so He has granted the Son to have life in Himself and has given Him authority to execute judgment also because He is the Son of Man. In chapter 5, Jesus says, You've all read Moses, right? Well, you should know that Moses was writing about me. There's just no escaping this. John believed Jesus is God. Of course, there are critics who think the deity of Christ was some kind of later invention, something the church dreamed up at the Council of Nicaea. But the only way you can believe that is to ignore the Gospel of John, because there's just no mistaking it. This is not describing a good man or a wise teacher. It's describing God in human flesh. Which means that you and I don't have to seek a path to God, because He already found a path to us. It was impossible for human beings to restore their broken connection to God because our hearts were so damaged when we stepped away from Him. We just didn't have the tools we needed to make our way back. So instead, God became one of us, a real flesh and blood human being who is also fully God. And He bridged the gap between God and humanity so successfully that it changes everything. That's why you should be reading John's account for yourself. And you better get comfy because I promise you, if you're honest with the text, you're going to find an awful lot to think about.